Good evening, everybody. The gallery is filling fast. This is, this is great. We'll continue to admit audience members, but let's get going. I'm Dorothy Skye. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin, I'm so delighted to welcome you to this statewide presentation on the national popular vote. What a fine way to top off this spring day. I hope the weather was okay way out there in Oregon. <laughs> Our speakers will advocate from their three different perspectives for making the national popular vote determine the winners in the US presidential and vice presidential elections. Here's how we'll use the Zoom functions this evening. You see this screenshot here. Because there are so many people in the audience, we recommend that you click on this view icon up here in the right-hand corner of your screen and select the speaker's view. That way you'll see the speaker predominant on the screen. When you are not speaking, please mute yourself, the little icon in the lower left-hand corner. When you wanna enter a chat, a, a comment or a question, click on the chat icon and type it in. And in the Q&A section, when, if and when you want to state a question in person, you'll click on the reaction button and then on the raise hand to be called on. Tonight, our, our panel of speakers will advocate for state legislation in Wisconsin and throughout our nation to guarantee that every vote counts equally in our US presidential and vice presidential elections. And that the presidential and vice presidential candidates who get the majority of the votes nationally will be declared the winners. That sounds fair and logical, right? Surely the constitution requires this. Unfortunately, the US constitution is not. That can be explained by a bit of constitutional history that we can easily relate to after our, our confinement during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can understand how the Constitutional Convention delegates who signed the final document were exhausted after confinement for deliberation throughout the summer of 1787 in that stifling hall in downtown Philadelphia. The delegates were impatient to go home to their families. They wanted to begin the campaign for, ratif for ratification of the Constitution they'd worked so hard to create. So when it came down to one of the last issues, the method of electing the president and vice president, the founders wrote very general instructions in Article 2, Section 1 and left the rest up to the states. Subsequently, the rise of political parties led to the current state laws governing our electoral college system. As a result of that system's shortcomings, five of our presidents won the majority of the electoral college votes and thereby won the presidency while losing the popular vote. The most recent was former President Donald Trump in the 2016 election, but there were four others. It's high time we fixed this unforeseen imperfection in our election system. We've got a lively discussion planned this evening to introduce that, the legislation that would accomplish this and to address how to get that legislation enacted. So please join me in welcoming tonight's three excellent speakers who are well versed to inform and inspire us regarding the national popular vote. Eileen Reeby, our featured speaker, is the co-founder and national grass grassroots dire director for the National Popular Vote Organization. She works on building momentum and support for the national popular vote nationwide and on training volunteers to be organizers and informed advocates for the cause. Eileen is based in Portland, Oregon. Representative Gary Hebel is the 46th Assembly District representative in the Wisconsin State Assembly. He's currently serving a sixth term in the legislature, having been first elected in 2004. He's also an attorney and a small business owner. Representative Hebel is a sponsor of Wisconsin's National Popular Vote Bill, AB 246 which was introduced in the Wisconsin State Assembly on April 8, 2021. 
He will update us on AB 246 and explain what the public can do to support that legislation. Barbara Klein is a member of the League of Women Voters of the United States National Popular Vote Task Force. She will share with us the activities of that task force. Dr. Klein has been a League member for over 20 years and has held many offices and served numerous tasks within, the lo within local leagues, state leagues in, in Arizona and Oregon and the National League. She concentrates on election reform issues such as ranked choice voting, redistricting, national popular vote, electoral structure, and voter protection efforts. After the speaker's prepared remarks, we've reserved time for an interactive Q&A with questions that you audience members have uh, entered into the chat box. We'll alternate between chat box questions and uh, in-person questions from the floor. Then we'll finish with a quick turn through what you can do to give you ideas so you can act on the motivation we've hopefully inspired. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And turn it over to Eileen. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Dorothy. So I look forward to speaking with all of you this evening. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to learn more about this critical issue. So how do we elect the president by national popular vote? We can do it by 2024 with enough help uh, and I'm looking forward to telling you all how. But first, I wanna do a, a very brief recap on how we elect the president now, right? Because we use the electoral college. And what does that actually mean? Just as a, a brief reminder, so on election day, you and I cast our ballots for the candidates of our choice. But the real vote is in December when electors meet and cast their ballots. So 538 electors are truly the ones who decide who the next president of the United States is. States are allocated one electoral vote for every representative that they have in Congress. So that means one for every House member and then one for each of their two US senators. So to win the presidency, you need 270 electoral votes because that's a majority of the current number of electoral votes. So who are these people? They're electors, they decide who the next president is, but we often have no idea who they are. So the US Constitution gives explicit power to the states to decide how their electors are chosen. Specifically, Article 2, Section 1 says, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. So those 17 words are the entire instructions in the Constitution for how states should choose their electors, just that it's up to them. So state legislatures deciding how to award their own electoral votes is a power that the Supreme Court has termed a plenary power or an absolute power of the states. So currently, 48 states in the District of Columbia have chosen to award their electoral votes based on whoever received the most votes in their state on election day. So we refer to these as winner-take-all laws or statewide winner-take-all laws, and this is what Wisconsin has. So what this actually looks like in an election, in California, if the Democratic candidate receives the most votes, they get all 54 now with the new uh, census count of California's electoral votes. Same thing in Texas, if the Republican candidate gets all uh, of, or excuse me, gets the most votes within that state, they will get all 40 of Texas's electoral votes. So in 2020, if you are one of the 6 million Californians who cast a ballot for Donald Trump, or one of the 5.2 million Texans who cast a ballot for Joe Biden, your vote was effectively thrown out at the state line. It was not represented when electors went to vote on behalf of your state. Because you voted in the minority, 100% of the electors went and represented someone else. Uh, and your vote was not really represented at the national level. So these winner take all laws that are implemented by the states 
are actually how we end up with divergent elections, which is the term that we use when the popular vote winner is the electoral college loser. So this leads us to discussing the problems resulting from the current system, because it is more than that the second place candidate can win the White House, although that is a big one. That's the number one thing that I think comes to mind for a lot of folks when we talk about the problems of the way that we elect the president. Five of our 46 presidents, so 10%, have been elected despite losing the popular vote. This is something that is not uh, an infrequent occurrence uh, or a fluke. It's something that has happened five of 46 times and twice just in the last two decades this has happened. And if that weren't something that were concerning enough, we're actually in an era of close elections right now. So looking at the last 20 years of presidential no, elections- No, because I don't know what's wrong. Uh, um, looking at the last 20 years of presidential elections, um, we've had two elections where the person who got less votes ended up in the White House. And we've actually had two near misses where that very nearly happened and again. Those examples, in 2004, so just four years after the first divergent election uh, in modern history, if 60,000 voters in Ohio had cast their ballot for John Kerry instead of George Bush, John Kerry would have won the state of Ohio, won the Electoral College, and gone on to be the next president of the United States, despite losing the popular vote by a larger margin than Donald Trump did in 2016. And if 60,000 votes sounds like a lot, 115 million ballots were cast in that election that year. So 60,000 voters going the other way is something that was very close to happening. And then the second instance of this near miss for another divergent election was just last year. If 21,847 voters had changed their minds and had voted for Donald Trump instead of Joe Biden, which specifically that's about 5,200 voters in Arizona, 5,900 voters in Georgia, and 10,300 voters in Wisconsin, Trump would have won the 37 electoral votes that came from those states. So just 22,000 votes could have completely changed the outcome of the election because what would have happened at that time is that we would have had a tie in the electoral college of 269 to 269. And what happens in the event of a tie is about as undemocratic, uh, if not worse, than the, the person who gets less votes entering into the office. If there is a tie in the Electoral College, the decision is made by the US House of Representatives. But it is not on a one House member, one vote basis, but on a one state, one vote basis. So we know that Trump would have been reelected because the US House of Representatives uh, in the current Congress, Republicans control a majority of state delegations. So we know that he would have then gone on to have a second term despite his popular vote loss of over 7 million votes. So effectively, each of those 22,000 votes for Joe Biden in those three critical states was 329 times more important and more impactful than the 7 million plus people who voted for Joe Biden across the country and made up his popular vote lead. So this isn't something that is uh, likely to go away. It's, it's something that's likely to keep happening, especially right now because we're in this era of close elections. And we were very, very close to having this happen again last year. So this brings us to what we call, uh, what I would say is the second big problem of the way that we elect the president currently, and that's the battleground state problem. So the battleground states have some significant advantages over the rest of the country. So winner take all laws mean that most states are decidedly red or decidedly blue before the election even begins. And candidates in the general election only campaign for a small number of votes in those closely divided states. So those are the swing states or battleground states. So the entire general election happens in 12 states or less. And those are the states that truly get to decide who the next president is. So if you look at uh, the maps here, this shows uh, general election campaign events for the last three presidential cycles. In 2012, 100% of those general election events were in just 12 states. 
two thirds of them uh, were in just four states. Similarly, in 2016, 94% of general election events occurred in just 12 states. And again, in 2020, 96% of events occurred in just a dozen states. Last year, Florida and Pennsylvania together, just those two states received 37% of all general election campaign events. So battleground states have outsized power during an election year because they attract all of this attention, but the impacts of them go beyond campaigning. It's not just about the fact that, you know, maybe when you're living in a battleground state, you got to meet presidential candidates and, and meet maybe the next president of the United States, but it really affects much more than that. So for example, um, it affects federal grants. Dr. John Hudak from the Brookings Institute found that overall controlling for variables, including a state size and natural disaster relief funds, presidential election swing states received 7.6% more federal grants than safe states, worth about 5.7% grant dollars between 1996 and 2008. Now, you might say, ah, 5%, 7%, that's not too big of a deal. But when we're talking about the federal budget, this equates to huge amounts of money. If you take Tennessee, which is an average size state for this time period, they would have likely have received 300 more federal grants worth a total of $60 million every year that they were a swing state. So this is something that is a real money that can have a real impact and a real change within these states. And highly competitive swing states get twice as many disaster declarations as non-competitive or flyover states. A lot of money and support comes with those. You'd think they'd be based on the severity of the disaster, if uh, the ability of the local government to respond. If there's a compounding event, maybe that state had a hurricane nearby just a month ago when they're really strapped. You'd think there'd be this complex formula deciding where this money goes. But really, it's pork barrel politics, and we're seeing it being played at the national level uh, when swing states are getting twice as many disaster declarations as safe states. And then the third advantage is around shaping policy, because we see candidates propose policies geared towards winning over specific voters in swing states. So two examples of this. No Child Left Behind was proposed by a Republican candidate for president and was the largest federal action taken into public education in the history of our country. The federal government getting involved in something traditionally run by states is not really what you expect from a Republican candidate for president. But this policy was geared towards winning over education-minded voters, moms, in Ohio. And it was in fact signed into law in the Cincinnati suburbs after George Bush won the election in part because he won Ohio and of course, because of his uh, victory in Florida. On the other side of the aisle, we can look at the Obama administration. When President Obama was running for reelection, he had a federal tax credit program promoting clean energy. Ohio companies got nearly four times the average that went to other states. So states that happen to be closely divided during an election year benefit immensely from being a battleground state. And you all might be thinking, okay, why would we want to change that when we're a battleground state and we have this advantage? And the really important thing to remember is that your status as a battleground state is temporary. It is fleeting. There is no guarantee that you will be a battleground state in the next election and certainly not four years after that or beyond that. And if you are an individual or a legislator, I think it's important for people to think about, well, I want my children to be able to move out of state and have their vote be equal regardless of where they move. I want to be able to stay here and have my vote always matter equally uh, regardless of the fact of if Wisconsin moves in or out of battleground state status. Because we, we do see that happen. You can look at Virginia and Colorado were both battleground states in 2016. No one was wondering how they were gonna go in 2020 because they very quickly moved into the safe democratic category. And we see shifts like that every year. And we know that it's, it's good to keep in mind that you wanna make every vote equal because you don't wanna hold on to being a battleground state because you never know that you will be uh, again in the next presidential election. So the system is hurting the country as a whole. The candidate who wins less popular votes can win the election and has more than 10% of the time in our nation's history. In the last two decades, we've had this happen twice and two additional near misses. 
And the repercussions are many. Consider the fact that five of our nine Supreme Court justices have been appointed by a candidate who originally lost the popular vote. Every American's vote is not equal. Nearly all campaigning happens in 12 states. Swing states pick the president while the rest of the country has their votes and their opinions taken for granted. And swing states, they are the beneficiaries of more federal funding and more disaster declarations and have more clout. And we're watching policy be shaped around their needs rather than what's best for America as a whole. So how we should elect the president instead is with one person, one vote, the national popular vote. Whoever gets the most votes becomes the president. This is how we elect almost every other office in the country. And it's time that we modernize our presidential elections to make every vote equal. Every vote being equal would mean that candidates would have to care about the entire population's interests, not just those in the swing states. So if we look back at the 2020 election, maybe we wouldn't have heard about fracking in both the presidential and vice presidential debate. Individuals working in the natural gas industry, there are more people working in logging in the state of Oregon than there are people working in the natural gas industry in the entire country. But you don't hear about that, right? Because we know how Oregon's gonna vote. But fracking is a, an industry that is very important to a, what was a critical swing state in 2020, Pennsylvania. So do we all need to hear about that? Or maybe we would have heard about the wildfires that were affecting states that one in five Americans lived in this past summer during the debates instead. So with a national popular vote, we're transforming the way that we elect the president for the betterment of everyone in the country so that all of our voices can be equal. And the way that we can do this and the way that we can do this by within this decade, if not by the next presidential election, is through the national popular vote interstate compact. So this bill would guarantee the presidency to the candidate who receives the most popular votes in all 50 states in DC. So you win the popular vote, you win the electoral college. This is a bill passed by states to change how they vote in the electoral college. So what states do is they replace the current winner take all law with a new state law that awards their electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote in all 50 states in DC. It's important to note that this bill only goes into effect when states with 270 electoral votes have been committed to the compact. And that number I'm sure stands out to you. That's the number that you need to win the presidency because that's a majority of the electoral votes. So when you have a majority of electoral votes committed to the national popular vote winner, that is how you can guarantee that the electoral college winner will be the person who won the national popular vote. So this is a state law that we're advocating for. And we're already 72% of the way towards making this happen. We have 15 states in DC have signed on representing 195 electoral votes. Uh, and that's the number under the new um, electoral vote math that we just got from the census earlier this month. So that means we only need 75 more electoral votes to make this happen. And we've already in previous legislative sessions been passed in at least one chamber in the nine additional states with 88 electoral votes. So if we just passed it in those states where we already have some momentum from previous years, then we'd have enough electoral votes to make this happen. Right now, national popular vote, uh, this 2021 legislative session, we saw our bill introduced in 15 states uh, throughout the country. Uh, it's still pending before several, and of course, including in Wisconsin, which we'll hear more about in a moment. And so there are a lot of misconceptions that sometimes people have around how this bill will actually work. And so the a good thing to keep in mind is that this is a nonpartisan solution. It's not a reaction to the 2016 election. This organization, National Popular Vote, was founded in 2006. Uh, and so it was a, around a full decade before Donald Trump was elected. And it's not a left or a right issue. It's an American issue that puts voters first and makes every vote equal. And it's something that I think all voters can and should get behind because it's not about benefiting one party or the other. It's about making every vote equal. And it is constitutional. Um, as I talked about at the beginning, determining how electors are chosen is an exclusive power of the states. 
And that goes back to that uh, Article 2, Section 1 from the Constitution. So we use the power granted to the states in the Constitution by the framers in order to achieve a national popular vote. That same power is what has allowed states to enact the winner take all laws, as well as have the congressional district system that Maine and Nebraska use. So there's no reason that we can't use that same power and award the electors based on the national popular vote. And if you're thinking, all right, but isn't there something in the constitution about interstate compacts and congressional consent? Um, so yes, article one, section 10 does say that congressional consent is required for interstate compacts. However, the Supreme Court has ruled for over 100 years that congressional consent is only necessary for compacts that encroach upon federal supremacy. So we do not believe our bill encroaches upon federal supremacy because it is a power explicitly left up to the states in the Constitution. Um, so we don't believe that consent is necessary. Now, if after our bill reaches 270 electoral votes, the Supreme Court decides to overturn 100 years of precedent and say that we need to get congressional consent, that's okay. We will go and lobby Congress and get consent the same way that we have lobbied all 50 state legislatures on this bill um, and get it at that time. It's not the norm to get it ahead of time, especially when you don't think that you need it. And folks ask about, well, what about withdrawing from the compact? Is, is that something that states can do? And so states are able to withdraw from the compact. However, they cannot do so between a really important six month period, which is July 20th of an election year and six months later, inauguration day of the following year. So the compact must be in effect with at least 270 electoral votes by July 20th of an election year so that both candidates know the rules of the election and, and how the election is gonna be decided before the general election begins. That six month period starts before the major parties even have their conventions to officially nominate their candidates and includes the entire period of campaigning in the general, all of our time periods for voting, the day that the electors meet, the day that Congress counts the ballots all the way up until the next president is inaugurated. And so this blackout period ensures that a state doesn't try to withdraw to, to game the system and say at the last minute, oh, we're a state that has all democratic control and it looks like the Republicans gonna win the national popular vote. We want out of this compact. We, we'd rather take our chances with the old system. They, and they're thinking that maybe six weeks before the election. They cannot withdraw during that time period. Uh, this is enforced not by me, our organization, a governor or even a secretary of state, but it's enforced by the impairments clause of the US constitution. And no state in the history of our country has ever left an interstate compact without adhering to the terms of that compact. And there's often questions about, well, what would the framers or the founders of the country think of this? So it's important to keep in mind um, and this is something that Dorothy alluded to at the beginning, that you know, the, at the founding of our country, they came up with the concept of choosing electors and they debated how that, those electors should be chosen. Not a single one of the items that they debated or voted on was the winner take all law that 48 states use today. The founders decided to leave it to the state legislatures. They were the closest body to the people. They could decide what was best for the voters in their state. Our current system is nothing like it was at the founding of our country. Uh, in our first presidential election, only five states allowed citizens to vote in any form. And those citizens were of a very particular description of white men with wealth. Only three states used the winner take all law in the first election and all three repealed it by the next election. So, when people say that we can't change it because the founders came up with this great system and we have to adhere to that, we're not electing the way the president the way that we did at the founding of our country. The way that we elect the president now uh, wasn't used uh, by a majority of states until the 10th election for president. So 30 years after the, the drafting of the constitution. So what we are doing is actually what the founders intended. 
the, they left it up to the state legislatures and we are asking the state legislatures to consider what is in the best interest of their citizens and of all Americans, because we think that electing the president by national popular vote is better for everyone. And we're asking them to consider that very unique constitutional duty. And of course, folks get concerned about small states thinking, well, they must hate this idea because the, the candidates will never go there or their votes won't really matter. But the, it's actually the opposite. The small states are actually the most disadvantaged and ignored group of states under the winner take all system uh, currently. And the reason for that is because presidential power under our current system doesn't come from being a big state or a small state, a rural state or an urban state, but it comes from being a closely divided state during an election year. And the small states, if you look at the 13 smallest states with three or four electoral votes, six of them are decidedly Republican, six of them are decidedly Democratic, and one of them is sometimes a swing state. So they're not being ignored because of their small status or their red or blue status, but just because they're not, uh, well, they are being ignored because of the fact that they uh, are safely red or safely blue. Um, looking at this uh, cartoon that I should have here, if we look at the 2008, 2012, and 2016 elections, um, the eight smallest states had one campaign visit during that time uh, while they had 24 electoral votes. At the same time, your state had 40 general election campaign events, um, despite only having 10 electoral votes. So it's not the number of electoral votes that really makes a difference in our elections. It's if you happen to be a closely divided state. And one other thing on this, sometimes people think, well, the small states are supposed to have an advantage in the electoral college. Regardless if they do now or not, they're supposed to. And that's just not true. The US Senate exists to give equal suffrage to the states. That is not the purpose of the Electoral College. And you don't just have to take my word for it either. Uh, state legislators in Hawaii, Delaware, Vermont, DC have all looked at our bill and signed on because they realized that their citizens would be better off under a national popular vote. And then of course, people also think, oh, okay, but the candidates are just gonna campaign in New York and LA and they're never gonna come to where I live. Uh, and I don't really feel comfortable with that. But no, New York City and Los Angeles are not gonna decide who the next president is on their own. This is a common misconception that stems from people thinking that big cities are a lot bigger than they actually are. But if you look at the 100 largest cities in America, and number 100 on that list is Spokane, Washington with 208,000 people, which is not exactly a liberal metropolis because lots of people think big cities equals democratic votes. 100 largest cities in America only makes up 19% of the US population. It just so happens that if you look at the number of people living in rural America as defined by the US census, that is also 19% of the US population. So you can know more just talk to the voters in the 19% of voters in the US cities, then you could just talk to the 19% of voters in rural America and expect to win the presidency. You have to talk to both groups and very importantly, the 62% of Americans who live in the suburbs in between these two places in cities less with less than 200,000 people and they are evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. So under a national popular vote, your candidates are going to have to talk to everyone and go everywhere. They're going to campaign in all 50 states because even our smallest state of Wyoming, they have 550,000 people. That was the margin of victory in the popular vote in the 2000 election. So under a national popular vote, states aren't going to be ignored just because they, it's a group of people that happen to live within a defined boundary. That's what happens now. And we're going to get rid of that under a national popular vote and the candidates are going to go all over and we don't have to guess at this because we know that when every vote matters in a presidential election for example within battleground states candidates go all over if you look at uh there's a memo on our website about this nas at nationalpopularvote.com that looks at where candidates go within swing states you can look at Phil at Pennsylvania. The candidates didn't just go to Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. They went all over the state because they recognize that voters are all over. And we'll just have that at a national scale with national popular vote. 
So we'll have no flyover states, no swing states, no blue states, no red states, just voters. The national popular vote bill would guarantee the presidency to the candidate with the most votes. Every voter in every state would be politically relevant in the presidential election for the very first time in the history of our country. That's a gift that we can give to future generations. The reality of it is that we are a compilation of very diverse people with different opinions who happen to live in different states. When people cast their ballots on election day, I think that they're thinking about what's most important to the entire country, not just their specific date. I think most folks cast their ballots as Americans, not as Oregonians or Pennsylvanians or Floridians. And the national popular vote bill allows our electoral system to reflect this reality about America and have the true will of the people decide who sits in the one office that represents all of us. So with that, um, I know we're gonna talk a little bit about getting involved. Um, certainly if uh, participating with the League of Women Voters is an excellent way to stay involved. The League in Wisconsin has been a tremendous force for good on this issue and just staying involved with them is a great way uh, to keep in touch about this issue. Um, but you also, if you're outside of Wisconsin and you're perhaps tuning in, um, you can also sign up at nationalpopularvote.com slash volunteer. You'll get linked up with me and I will connect you with a grassroots group in your state and uh, let you know how you can help our efforts nationwide. So I'll stop there uh, and look forward to answering your questions after the, the following speakers. Excellent, Eileen, thank you. And you've stopped your screen share, good. Okay, at, at the end, we will reiterate those what you can do steps. But uh, for now, we wanna step out of the national scene and into the state scene and ask Representative Hebel to discuss with us his uh, support, his sponsorship of Assembly Bill 246, where it came from, where it's going, how we can help. So Representative Hebel. Thank you, Dorothy, and thank you to the uh the uh, League of Women Voters. What a fantastic organization and one that does such a great job of educating the populace on candidates and elect, elect issues. I can't good things about the League. You've done phenomenal things and continue to make our elections what they are. So thank you for that. Uh, Eileen's presentation was very well done. Thank you, Eileen, for your work. And uh, with regards to the state of Wisconsin, I'm Gary Hebel. I represent the 46th Assembly District, which is Eastern Dane County, uh, just outside of Madison. So I'm in the heart of the state and uh, I'm very fortunate to be the author of the bill, uh, which we talked about, it's Assembly Bill 246. And just a brief primer on how a bill becomes law is initially it's introduced and uh, it uh, goes to, it's assigned to a committee. And that committee in this case, uh, the bill was introduced on April 8th, 2021, and it was assigned to the Committee on Campaigns and Elections. And we have 22 Democratic co-sponsors. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get any Republicans to sign on, but the list of uh, sponsors is growing. And we have solicited Republicans to join in with our campaign, but unfortunately they vote in a block. And so it's difficult to, uh, to pick them off, but, uh, we're still working very hard uh, to try to get uh, make this bipartisan. I think um, Eileen hit it on the head. This really is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, the popular vote is the way we should elect our, our national leaders. And it only makes sense that the one with the most votes should be the winner. With regards to the committee, the campaigns and elections, uh, it's interesting uh, because five of the seven Republicans on the committee we're part of the 15 Wisconsin Republican legislators who asked Mike Pence not to certify the results of the 2021 presidential election. So that tells you right out the gate that uh, we've got an uphill battle when we're dealing with uh, members of that committee who don't believe the election was valid. We all know that this was the most secure election in history. It's very well documented and every case that's come before the courts, either statewide or nationally, has been turned away, uh, indicating that the election was, was fair and proper. 
So we do have an uphill battle in Wisconsin to try to get this bill passed. And what can we do in Wisconsin to accomplish our goal? There's two areas that would really help us tremendously. The first one deals with redistricting. And uh, Governor Evers has put together the Citizens Task Force on uh, Redistricting, has done a phenomenal job, and that group has worked diligently to create, create fair maps. They will be presenting a, a map once the um, population um, census has been confirmed, and uh, they will propose that, that the maps. And we will also get an alternate map from the Republican leadership in, the, uh, in the, our legislature. And they're constantly, they're spending tons of money. Uh, there currently is a lawsuit that, uh, that they couldn't uh, clear a term for the issue was brought before them. And that, uh, that decision was uh, affirmed today and now it will go to court of appeals. So our first goal is to try to get redistricting fair because if we do that, there have been more democratic votes in a state in the uh, statewide elections over the last several years. And certainly it's been very close. Wisconsin is a purple state, if you will, and it's very close. But the legislature should be almost equally divided. Right now, our assembly with 99 members has, uh, we have 38 Democrats and 61 Republicans. It should be closer to 50-50 or 50-49 because of the statewide uh, voting. The same way is true in the Senate. The Senate currently is made up of 21 Republicans and 12 re uh, Democrats. So redistricting, a fair uh, uh, redistricting would really help our cause because then the legislators would be uh, answering to their constituents, not to the powers that be and the money that be through Citizens United and things like that. So that's the first angle to try to get this popular vote um, idea passed in Wisconsin. Now, the second angle that would work, would help us a lot, is the Supreme Court. Right now, it's, there's seven members in the Supreme Court. And uh, I'm proud to say that Wisconsin Supreme Court is made up of a majority of women. So at least in that regard, it's come in electing women to the Supreme Court. And I'm very happy with that. Unfortunately, they're not the, the political vent that I would like them to be. And uh, so we do have a four to three conservative majority. And uh, the uh, Pat Rogan Sack, who was the uh, chief and will be stepping down, is 81. She's up for election in uh, 2023. I personally don't think she'll run again. And so if we could take that seat, she's one of the strongest conservatives on the uh, Supreme Court. If we could switch that over to a, a uh, a uh, more uh, progressive uh, judge, we would have the majority four to three. And then these decisions that the Supreme Court is currently making against democracy, against fair elections, like all these issues, we would have a better chance of getting those issues decided in the right way, if you will. I remember Shirley Abramson told me that you're either conservative and you're, you're far right or you're um, uh, you're uh, progressive, which means you're right on point. And so I always enjoyed talking to her. She was a brilliant lady, lady one of the most fantastic judges Wisconsin is, and the, the nation has ever known. But uh, what a, a true loss when she passed recently. So in summary, we're doing our best to try to get this legislation passed in Wisconsin. And we have some huge battles to hills to climb, if you will, and we're doing everything that we can, and we'll continue that fight. I appreciate your support uh, and uh, continue to talk to your legislators if you are a Wisconsin resident, and uh, eventually the right wins out. It's just that we have to fight our battles and uh, give it our best shot, so we'll continue to do that. Thank you very much for inviting me. You bet. Thank you, Representative Hebel. And I, I just want to ask you one little thing, uh, moderator's preemptive choice. How, uh, is there any way we can help get even get that bill out of committee? 
Well, the way it works in the legislature is the committee chair is the one that determines which bills get a hearing. And so any pressure that you can uh, lend to the uh, committee chair, I don't know the committee chair offhand, but I can get that information to everyone uh, very quickly, but I don't have that right at my fingertips. Uh, no, but that would be, Gary. go ahead. Who is it? It's Janelle Branchin. Janelle Branchin is the um, representative who's the uh, chair of that uh, committee. And I can get contact information for anyone uh, certainly any constituent of hers uh, would be super, uh, but just anybody in the state just contacting her is a great idea. So we want to put some pressure on her to at least give us a public hearing and get it before the, uh, before the public. Great. If uh, you or your staff person could get her name and contact information in the chat, that would be a great way to get that recorded. Chris, my staff or we'll put that in at least early. Okay, now I would like to reintroduce Dr. Barbara Klein. She is um, on the League of Women Voters of the United States National Popular Vote Task Force. And uh, Dr. Klein, Go ahead and share your screen and share your information with us. I think I did. Does everybody see the full screen? Got it. Okay, great. Um, and thank you, Dorothy, for having me here tonight. You know, I have to admit, this is going to be the easiest talk on national popular vote I have ever given. Um, thanks to Eileen, who gave all the great details, and um, it, it's so nice to hear her presentation. Um, you know, it was two weeks after Election Day in 2000 when I joined the League of Women Voters, and I was on a mission. I, you know, I knew something was wrong. I cared about um, money and politics and gerrymandering electoral systems and that particular month, the Electoral College. And so I joined the League of Women Voters. Now, frankly, I knew very little about any of those subjects at the time. I learned, but um, it, it took some time. Some League members um, may not have been familiar with national popular vote until this evening. But the League has actually known about the effort and been involved with the effort for a long time. And so I hope people will read more and learn more even after um, Eileen's presentation so that you can support it even, even more than you do now. And I'm going to cover some of the things that the League does. Um, now, if we can... Um, go forth. <laughs> um, we are having trouble going forward to the next screen. Let's see. Uh, we may have to we may have to try a different. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, first, I want to point out something. I know this is usually done traditionally at the end of a presentation. Um, but I think it's one of the most important things I might leave with you tonight. Unlike Mr. Google, our league search engine is not always the most friendly and most helpful. And I want you to know where you can find information on the league site that's about national popular vote. So notice that it's after our.org slash it's MPV task force. And that's just something for you to remember. And I'm taking a few of my minutes tonight to share the national popular vote background as it applies to the League of Women Voters and what we've done. Now, for over 50 years, if you notice that date up there, over 50 years, we have had a position to abolish the Electoral College. We still do. Um, we support abolishing the Electoral College. Um, Eileen didn't mention it this time, but um, the MPV plan improves the electoral college by eliminating the winner take all kinds of um, systems. So 
we support both in, in the League of Women Voters now. And we started pretty early. If you notice, in 2006, at that convention, we gave away, the table was piled up with the big book, um, Every Vote Equal. Um, and we gave out hundreds of those to League members who were interested in this subject um, at that convention. And we always reminded them that they had to read the myths chapter, which is still phenomenal um, and, and tells you everything you would like to know. So that was 2006 when we first started education. And then in 2008, um, we got a study adopted, a two year study. And um, I was pleased to be part of that effort and to serve on the committee. And that taught a lot of people, all those leaguers around the nation that took part in that, learned a lot during that study. In 2010, um, we, had, we had a little bit of problem with our consensus questions during that time as something got left out. But through concurrence, we did adopt a position that supports the National Popular Vote Plan. Now, again, we still support abolishing the Electoral College too, but we just believe that the National Popular Vote Plan is more practical at this time and probably more doable. It doesn't mean that if tomorrow there was a, a vote on abolishing the Electoral College that we wouldn't be there, but for now, we think that this is the more practical application. So in 2010, that was adopted by the membership. Um, then we had a few years where national didn't do a whole lot, but a lot of states did. You were learning and promoting the bill in your own legislatures and, um, and, and doing a lot of work at that time. And then in 2018, the convention decided we wanted to make the national popular vote part of the um, make democracy, what is it? Make democracy work goals. And that's what we did. We um, put it in that platform. And that was how the task force got started. Um, the first step we took was to interview a lot of you. Somebody on this call might have been one that answered a lot of our questions. We interviewed state leagues all over the place. Um, it, I don't know if it was every one of them, but if not, it was close to it. And we wanted to know how much your league members knew, whether you um, were active in the position, what the interest was, all those kinds of things. And we heard very good um, responses. Now, granted, some were afraid that in their state it would never pass. But as Eileen said, this is a bipartisan issue in reality. And we hope that more leagues talk about that. So anyway, that was the first step. And we found that there was sufficient interest for us to do more. And the next step was to figure out practical ways that we could help league members. And that brings us to resources. Oh, I, I actually, before we get to resources, I always forget this. So I, I put it in there to remind myself. Also on the web page that I have there, there um, are some little bios on both the task force people and the activists that are very active all over the nation today, league members that are active in a lot of different states. So it's kind of interesting to read um, what they're up to. So one of the major resources that we have on that page is the National Popular Vote PowerPoint presentation. Now this is league centric. Um, Eileen and National Popular Vote Organization have wonderful um, materials and we use them liberally, um, but this is a league centric presentation and you are all allowed to use it in whatever way you want. I mean, any league member or league, if you wanna show it to your Aunt Hattie and teach her how this works, that's <laughs> fine. And if you want to show it to your local community, that's fine too. So it's there for you to use 
um, aside from a title slide, we ask that you not add pictures or other things into it, but you can hide as many slides as you like if you don't wanna do them all. And um, there's also at the bottom of it, there's probably an equal number of resource slides that are kind of to teach you how to answer some of the questions that come up and, um, and background so that you can offer more background to some of your members. So it's really um, a, a great resource. I hope that you will like the tool. And again, it's for any member who wants to use it at all. The second thing we did was a webinar that um, recorded webinar that's a video and it walks through um, a little bit of our background with the league and then also a presentation similar to Eileen's, maybe not as smooth as Eileen's, but similar to Eileen's and, um, and then some interviews with activists. And um, it is also available on that site and you can also link to it from your own web page. And this was done particularly because not all of you want to do a um, big presentation and you may either feel like you have too much on your plate right now or that you don't feel that you're kind of up to it. So at the very least, this is a link you can use for your members and the public to show them a little bit about what we're doing in the league, why we support it and, and um, the background of it how, it, how it works. Now, the blogs just got started and um, I think that's probably going to be a little ad hoc um, we're working on one right now, which is taking a little longer than I thought it might, but um, we'll see how it goes. And if people have ideas that they want addressed, um, I, I'd like to hear from you. And so would the others. Um, also, the idea of a discussion list is going back and forth. I really hope we do it. It's my favorite, favorite idea. And I think it would be really neat. It will depend on the interest that leagues have. So the question of how the task force could help you was, was one question. But I just want to remind you that there are other ways people want you to reach out to them, other members around the nation, whether it's in states that have already adopted it or states that are just working on it. And that goes for the task force as well. But this I really needed to point out because I thought it was so neat. In, um, in Florida, they have a spinoff group called um, Floridians for a National Popular Vote. And they do a real, they do great work. But one of the things they did was they created these kind of broad sheets, if you will. And they've been sending them out every, um, I, I think it's every week, maybe two weeks and using the league logos and all of that. And they are totally willing to um, help other leagues do the same thing, use their materials and um, I, don't, I don't know if other people are seeing this, but I'm seeing somebody right on the screen. It's very odd. Um, anyway, these are some of the issues that they're covering and they're very um, willing to help others share. And I want to remind you that the task force is willing to do the same thing. And I know we wanna get on to important questions. So I'll end it there. Thanks. And I'll stop my share. Okay, excellent, Dr. Klein. You you are pointing out the uh, power and value of the League of Women Voters. We know how to organize and how to connect. We got it going in the uh, women's suffrage movement. <laughs> that took seventy years. We'll hope this doesn't take another <laughs> seventy years. But uh, we're organized, we're right-minded, we cooperate and connect, and we don't quit. We persist. <laughs> so, uh, all righty, thank you. So we're gonna move on to the Q&A. Mary Nugent has been monitoring our chat for comments and questions. 
Yes, I have. And um, there's some very interesting conversations going on in the chat room. Um, so if you want to take a peek at that, um, there are several questions. Um, some of some of the we I, I think some people just want a little more information on some of the topics that were already that were already talked about or discussed. Um, one question is why didn't the founding founding fathers um, trust the popular vote? Why did they go with the system that they that we have? So I can go ahead and take that. So um, some of the framers, when they did vote for a popular vote, uh, some of them did vote for it. Uh, in fact, it, it passed in one round and then went back and then they had a subsequent round and said, no, let's try that again. Um, it, it, there was a lot of debate overall. There were some individuals who thought that it would be difficult uh, given the technology of the day. Yes, there were some that thought that they wouldn't be able to get information in, in the hands of all the voters for them to make an informed choice. Um, ultimately, though, you know, it, they did obviously decided on the electoral system. And I think it's good to keep in mind that the stakes were lower than you might think uh, when they made this decision. They took these 30 votes over 22 days. The, the how to choose the president was one of the very last things finalized at the Constitutional Convention in the Committee of Unresolved Business. And they already knew who the first president of the United States was going to be. They knew it was going to be George Washington. And so they came up with a system that said, OK, let's let the states decide how to figure this out. Uh, and, and that's essentially how we got the, the system that we have now. And I saw a question in there asking for more history on this as well. Um, someone recommended it, and I'll just echo the recommendation from Chris of Let the People Pick the President by Jesse Wegman. Um, he's a New York Times editorial board member. Uh, he interviewed uh, the National Popular Vote staff extensively for this book. It talks about the compact. It talks about the history of, the, of how we got the Electoral College in a very easy to understand and very readable manner. So I'd, I'd recommend that if people want more of that history. Yeah, from reading uh, Jesse Wegman's book, and also some of the accounts firsthand and secondhand of what the delegates to that convention were thinking, the, the state of the communication system <laughs> was big. I mean, we had this huge geography with people widely dispersed and the notion was there's there's no way that all these the scattered populace is going to get enough information to really understand to even have a chance to understand the issues or the candidates well hello here we are <laughs> uh, flying across the country in the ether and and everybody is getting facile with using it we have multiple media and uh, people have every opportunity to become informed individually. And so uh, why shouldn't their individual votes count equally? Are there any raised hands, Dorothy? Well, let's see. Now those should, yeah, those should uh, pop, pop up to the front of the line. Yeah, folks, okay. if you want, uh, I'll just remind you, if you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question in person, go to that little reactions button on the bottom of your right hand corner of your screen and then click on the raised hand and that will pop up a raised hand icon superimposed over your picture. Like Jane Benson just did. <laughs> and then I will call on Jane and say Jane unmute yourself and state your piece. What I wanted to comment on is the point you just made about so much information being available to individuals across the country now, but we know we do not share the same facts. And we have these silos of Fox News versus MSNBC and uh, social media silos where people only hear their echo chamber of what they I, they want to hear. And it's been a serious, serious problem having a, a, a consistent base of facts 
So I worry about that because we're unleashed. All of that, that, that corrupted information is unleashed. That was my point. And that is a dilemma that we are in the midst of. We're sunk in it. We are not going to have any immediate solutions to that. My God, this, this is as important as big a deal as the invention of the printing press. I mean, think what folks thought then. Uh, oh my God, we're not going to sift everything through the, uh, the few chosen individuals who uh, have access to the books and who know how to write. So we're in a we're in a new age, and that's going to take some adjustment. And I think that uh, one of the important roles of the League of Women Voters is to be a source of nonpartisan, well substantiated information. Um, we can't we can't make it all better right away, but we can make darn sure that we are true to our our mission and our principles. Dorothy, if I can just add on to that, um, one thing that the national popular vote provides is it actually makes our elections more secure. So right now you could have a targeted misinformation campaign, say over social media, targeted at one state, a swing state, and have enough influence with that, that that one state can change the outcome of the election. Same thing goes for voter suppression or voter fraud, depending on how you look at it. That can be hyper-targeted but you have less of that concern under a national popular vote because you're diluting any of that ill will or, or bad efforts across the entire you know, voting base of 180 plus million people. Leveling things out. <laughs> moving, moving on, there are several people that, that asked this same type of question. So I'm gonna kind of put them all together. How do we go about convincing the and i'm going to quote the party machinery um which has been through gerrymandering through money through all of the things that go into the art of winning an election how do we convince them that this is a good thing Representative, do you want to speak to that or do you want me to answer that? Go ahead and then I'll follow up. Um, so, I mean, talking to your legislators about this is, is really important and making sure that they understand how this bill actually works. Um, you know, we can say party machinery and we can be concerned about it from, from both sides of the political aisle, right? Uh, sometimes people think, well, Republicans have benefited from this in the two most recent elections, they're going to keep benefiting. And so there's no reason that they'd want to support a national popular vote. And that's one of those things that you got to break down that misconception with people, because the current system is unstable for both political parties. If you look at the 2020 election, um, Donald Trump did his job. He won the popular vote in the swing states by a million votes. He also won the popular vote in the swing states in 2016. The difference is in 2020, he didn't get that those votes in the right combination of states to win. And if you're a Republican strategist for president, you might look at that and say, oh, I don't know that I like that. It might be better off if we have one person, one vote. You also might look at the fact that Texas is always getting bluer and that after Georgia and Arizona flipped, if they stay blue, that makes it really hard for a Republican to win. And especially if Texas flips uh, even for one cycle. Um, so talking to legislators, showing up at their town halls and asking them about this issue and, you know, have you heard about it? I, this is something I think is really important. Can I have a meeting with you calling them and, and making your voice heard on this can be impactful. And just to follow up on that, uh, the um, dealing with it, it is a very difficult time in politics right now. Uh, the polarization is, is something I've never experienced before. And I've been a legislator for this is my ninth term. So 17 years in the Wisconsin legislature. And I love the job and I love the people there. And when I go one on one with the person from the opposing side, we have great conversations. And it's really, really unfortunate that when we get into our group activities, the polarization is, is exaggerated. 
And frankly, things need to change in order for representatives to truly represent the people of their district. And a couple of those are clear. One is the gerrymandering, which has devastated the independence of, of the legislators to really say what they want to say and do what they want to do. They're not beholden to their, to their uh, constituents. They're beholden to the leadership within their party. So gerrymandering is one issue. And then also the area of uh, Citizens United. The dark money has created such a void between what's good for the citizens and what's good for the special interest. And so those two areas are, would really, if we could get those problems solved, that would be huge. And then the final area is social media. The alternative facts, and, and you pointed out to it, alluded to it somewhat, is that people are constantly bombarded with the same information which they agree with. And um, I mean, I love this in NPR because I do get somewhat of an unfiltered uh, uh, view of what's going on on the outside. But, even today, when you've got Biden inviting the leaders of both parties into, into the, um, the White House and trying to work out, let's find out what we can agree on. And it's, it's amazing they cannot even agree, uh, agree to agree on things that we, infrastructure is clearly something that uh, we all need. And it's, politics have gotten so, so, uh, oh, I, I, the word is uh, it just poisonous that it's, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I am an optimist. And I saw in the chat room that uh, the person that responded said they like the optimism, but they're not optimistic. I have to be optimistic. If I wasn't optimistic, I couldn't, I couldn't continue living. I just, every morning I wake up, as the sun rises, we're going to have a good day. We'll give it our best. End of the day, I'm frustrated because we haven't done what we needed to do. But I'm going to keep fighting the fight because you know, things surprise you that you never expect happen happening. I mean, Georgia, that election where people got out and voted, who thought that those two senators would win? Maybe one, but most likely neither one. I mean, miracles happen, and that was a great result because the people spoke. And I think you just have to hang on to that optimism. That's the only way we're going to get through it. Thanks. Can I add on something, Dorothy? I, um, yeah. This is first a plug for the National Popular Vote Organization because we were talking about the league being um, nonpartisan and sticking to our party neutral ideas, which I love. And I have to say, um, I've known people in that organization for a long time and I also admire that they do the same and on their board, they also have a lot of um, Republicans and Democrats and independents. So I just wanted to put in that plug um, for them since Eileen probably wouldn't do that herself. And then, the other thing I was going to mention is that my own senator said to me, state senator, when I was talking to him um, before we passed national popular vote, um, he said, what can I say? He's a Democrat. And he said, what can I say to my Republican colleagues that think, well, the electoral college is working pretty well for them right now. And I said, you know, I was giving him information about saying, you know, the shoe can always be on the other foot quite, quite quickly. And, um, you know, and gave him information to back that up, some of which um, I, Eileen presented tonight. And he said, um, they think that's just theoretical. And um, I wonder if they would still have that, that thought after the last election when um, you know Donald Trump might have turned things around, but uh, anyway, just just a thought. Thank you. And Diane Falk has her hand raised. Diane. Yes, thank you. Uh, very, very much. I'm so excited to join this discussion tonight because I I watch the news and I try to I I always think that the certain well I I'm going to tell you point blank that I I. Democratic is the party that I, I stand by. That's not even important to the topic. The topic is fairness, is it not? And so we do want to have a situation where it is one person, one vote. I am totally for getting rid of the Electoral College altogether. It's a sort of a, historically, it's a racist thing and it's not fair. And as someone as was pointed out, the battleground states get wined and dined as if it were, <laughs> you know, the whole thing is nuts. What worries me is, it, and as was pointed out, the miracle of Georgia winning the two Senate seats is, it's a miracle. And that was the work of Stacey Abrams and all those people that were willing to just bust their butts. But the miracle, what happened after the miracle? 
the Georgia State Senate made sure that you think you won this time, buddy. Well, we're gonna we're gonna make the votes. We, we're gonna do ridiculous things so that you will not win again. You cannot give water out. And actually, the thing they don't mention is that if they want to change the outcome, the electoral the electoral uh, committee, whatever it's called exactly, can actually say no. Our guy won, even though the vote went the other way. But people got stuck on the fact you can't give water out, which is just sort of a bizarre thing. So I think that one of the facts is it's clear that the alternative facts is just simply lies, OK? And I think that the only way things are going to change is not by holding hands and singing Kumbaya, because it's clear Mitch McConnell himself has said, I will do nothing uh, that, to get Biden, help Biden, help the people. Now, one voted for the, to help with the, the people, the, the act to, um, not one of them did. So here we have a situation where we know that if we do not get fair voting, and we know that Texas, Georgia, the whole list of red states are changing their voting to make sure that they give themselves the advantage, meaning the Republicans, and that they win. If they win, simply put, we will lose our democracy. And if you like environment, forget it. If you like children, forget it. Education, forget it. Healthcare, forget it. It's over. So I think this niceness, something about the Democrats is so nice, but it makes them flaccid to me. It makes them ineffective. They're smart, they're kind, they're good. But in order to save our democracy, we must get the fair voting. That's why of all the things that need to get done in this country, I am with you. I want fair voting. One person, one vote would be preferable. But certainly what you're doing, the popular vote is, sec is also very good. Passing HR1, that's another thing we have to do. I just want us to be more effective, I guess. I think we need consequences for behavior. As an example, the last thing I'll say because I want to share the time is that today one of the Republican representatives from Georgia said that actually what happened at the Capitol on January 6th was just like a day of tourism. I mean, come the heck on. That should be put in prison suit. Something should happen. It's not like, oh, oh, well. We're too oh, well-ish. Nothing happens. Orwell. George Orwell happens when we're too oh, well-ish. And that, I'm going to stop with that kind of silly statement. But I, I hope that my, uh, I have all kinds of threads out there because I don't, I don't know. I only have limited time to speak. But I hope that my threads make some kind of a, something that is visible to the listeners. OK? And I thank you. And I'm very excited about your work. Very exciting. Diana, Diane, I appreciate your comments. And uh, talking about the multiple threads just alludes to the fact that this is complicated and there are a lot of threads to keep track of. And I want to turn your comments into two questions for our panelists. One, um, you, uh, Eileen, you give a great argument for the national popular vote. You know it, upside, inside, out. With that skill, do you honest, can you tell us honestly what you see are some shortcomings or some things that we got to watch out for if we enact the national popular vote? And uh, number two, in particular, the various voting reforms seem to be interconnected. You can't have one go right without the other. In particular, uh, what's going to happen to campaign spending and the cost of campaigns if candidates have to go full tilt in every state. So Eileen, give us some balance, some warnings. Yeah. Thanks. So I'll answer the second part of that first. When it comes to campaign spending, this is a question that comes up, and I think fairly so, especially from people that are concerned about the amount of money that is spent in our presidential elections. But the important thing to keep in mind is that right now, presidential candidates raise every single cent that they can. They are not saying, oh, no, thank you, billionaires. I don't need that $50 million to my super PAC. They are taking every single dollar that they can get, and that will stay the same under a national popular vote. It'll be the distribution of funds that change. So instead of spending $60 million in Pennsylvania and bombarding every one likely voter in that state with billboards and TV ads and radio ads, 
you might have that same amount of money spent across the entire mid-Atlantic area. So there, I don't think there's any reason to think that it will cause more money in politics. It'll just change where that money gets spent. Um, as far as shortcomings of national popular vote, uh, I mean, this was something that was very well crafted. Uh, the you know back in 2005 when this idea first came up uh, in a in a serious manner, we had uh, we being national popular vote, the organization had a number of lawyers come together and draft it in a way that makes us feel very confident in the language that it's going to work as intended. Um, I'd say, you know, opponents sometimes put out fear monger essentially about unintended consequences. I truly don't think that there will be, honestly, under national popular vote. The one person, one vote, most votes wins. It's how we elect our US senators, our governors, our members of Congress in every state except for Maine where they use ranked choice voting. Um, it is a system that is tried and true in this country. And that once we move to it, I think that we'll see a rapid number of states wanting to sign on and join the compact because of the fact that they're going to see that we're going to have newly enfranchised 100 million plus voters in this country. Can I add on to that too? Um, a lot of people will talk about recounts if we went to the National Popular Vote Compact and say, oh, if you're, you know, having to count everybody, wouldn't it be so awful? But the thing is, it still works the same way as it does now, state by state. We still have the Electoral College. We're working within the framework of the Electoral College. So it would still work the same way. And actually, um, right now, it's it's easier for little places to maybe be fraudulent in um, how how voting is done, but that couldn't happen when you have a bigger pool. But the the idea of a recount itself, I shouldn't get off on two tracks there, but the idea of a recount itself would still be state by state. Somebody asked about that in the chat, I think. Right. There were a couple questions about litigation and whether or not this could possibly be um, be more prevalent um, if, 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 the, if the vote was very close, you know, especially after the history of what happened this year, this past year, um, with litigation in so many different states. Um, so could you just, I, I know you sort of answered this now, but how would this handle this how would this proposal handle that sort of controversy um, or, or litigation? Or would yeah, it? So, so it would, the recounts would be done under the same laws that states have now, unless they change those laws. Um, so however those recounts are done, that would stay the same because our bill doesn't change that within those states. Broadly speaking, uh, I think that you will have less of an issue of recounts because we, all, of those 60 you know, plus uh, litigation cases that we had from the 2020 election, they were all in swing states. They were trying to flip the results in these critical states, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, to try and change the outcome of the election. But under a national popular vote, you won't have that hyper focusing on particular states. Uh, you, you wouldn't be able litigation in one state wouldn't really be able to have that effect of changing the outcome for the entire country. Um, it is just kind of a, a, a broader statement. It is the position of national popular vote that after our bill is enacted and we know that this is going to be the way that we elect the president in the next election. If they so choose, that would be the perfect time for Congress to consider if a federal recount bill is needed, specifically just for the presidential election to set a standard. Um, that would be the appropriate time to consider it um, if they, as the people who set the time manner in place of our presidential elections, uh, think it's necessary. One other quick thing that I wanna comment on um, that Diane said, and I'm seeing a couple comments in the chat. Um, especially after what happened in 2020, a lot of people were really concerned that state legislators could throw out the votes of the people and just completely ignore them and appoint their own slate of electors. And we didn't see that happen. And because that's extremely, extremely hard to have that happen, almost bordering on impossible because of several different layers of federal law. Um, so number one, 
I, I won't get too technical on this, um, but there is only one day in which electors can be chosen. That's the day set by Congress, uh, the second Tuesday after the first month or the first Monday, the, you know, in November. Um, on that day, whatever the law is in the state, on the, that day is the way that the electors must be chosen. The only thing that is uh, in the Electoral Count Act, which is a piece of federal law, that provides for changing that is if a state fails to make a choice, which that's not exactly clearly defined in the federal law what that actually means. Um, but it's they, if it was clear that two million more people got the votes in the state, and that's the way the, the law says that that means that Joe Biden gets the electoral votes, they would have to build a heck of a case to say that the people didn't make a choice. Um, so while it's very technically possible, I, I don't want that to be something people are worried about in future elections, because it's not something that you should be worried about, even if it is something that gets a little bit of media airtime. It's extremely unlikely, and I would say almost impossible. Thank right, you. Um, we're Norma, we're, Norma we're, Harrison. Yes, Mary. Norma. Okay, um, so we this kind of work sets ourselves a goal that is out of reach under the circumstances in which we live. You know, the ones I described early on in this discussion, and uh, to which I had some reasonable response. In case anybody wants to look at it, um, so we set ourselves with a goal here that we cannot reach we cannot reach equity in a situation where the ownership of our labor our lives uh, uh, we're still we're still colonized you know <laughs> decolonizing is very difficult looking at all the institutions that have control over us that make us behave this way with all these contradictions oh we should do this we should do that and all these suggestions are very substantial and worth considering, except that they can't achieve the ends that we want because the system doesn't permit it. So Norma, I've been so, Norma, I've been going, I gotta interrupt you. I, I'm almost Norma, done. Norma, one line. We gotta wrap. We gotta I, wrap I, it up, Norma. I'm I'm I, almost done. I, I, I can have tell one that you're a deep thinker. I have, I have and, one and, last and a logical, line. Uh, the line is skeptic, what would Q? We what need would to wrap Cuba it up. Do? What would I'm sorry, Norma. Do? I'm, I'm sorry to cut you short, Norma, but uh, we need to, to wrap it up. We've got another two minutes. And um, um, here's a, could we just add one more, one more question? Um, there is a question about um, um, funding. Um, and especially uh, specifically for for Representative Hebel, about um, his thoughts on public funding of of campaigns rather than private. Uh, that's a great question. I saw that and I wanted to respond to the chat. Uh, it's a very good question. I'm very very supportive of public funding for campaign. Studies have shown. That we are much better off campaigns would cost, cost much less. We'd get much better candidates running for office. In Wisconsin, the, the Wisconsin Supreme Court did have public funding of, of uh, their races for many years, and it worked very well. But Citizens United came in, and other uh, special interests came in and took that away. But it worked very well. Unfortunately, the special interest and the moneyed interest did not like the results of the Supreme Court and therefore the laws changed. But uh, I would be very supportive of that. I know Minnesota in the past has had some uh, funding of uh, public funding of elections. Limit the amount that is being spent and you're gonna get much better candidates. You're gonna be talking about issues. And frankly, candidates aren't gonna be spending their time calling and begging for money. They're gonna be talking about the issues. So it's a great question and I'm 100% behind it. Ultimately, the studies would show that it would work very well. Thank you. And I think that's a good point to end on that up note. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Hebel. My um, pleasure.
I was going to talk about the what you can do, but I think we covered that. Uh, Eileen covered that very well during the uh, her portion of the, of the discussion. So it's 8.30. It's time for us to end this very useful and wonderful discussion. I thank all of you for participating, audience members, and thanks particularly to our speakers, Eileen Reedy, the National Grassroots Director of the National Popular Vote, Representative Gary Hebel from the 46th Assembly District, and Dr. Barbara Klein from the League of Women Voters of the United States National Popular Vote Task Force. So, and thanks to you audience members, remember currently the best way to get the National Popular Vote in vote is for the Wisconsin legislature to pass that bill. So gives us some specific focus. So with that, I will say um, goodbye and thank you. Take care. <laughs>